Hi, friends. You having a good day? You good? Checking email? I was deleting email before. That's my job at Microsoft is to delete email. So I'm going to talk to you about uh, some of the thoughts that I've been having around JavaScript and virtual machines and uh, what has changed in the industry. I'm very happy to see that people stayed for the, uh, the lock note. It's like a keynote, but it closes the day. Uh, sometimes people don't come to my talks, and uh, it makes me a little bit sad. I like this guy, though. He came to the talk. Uh, so as uh, the very kind introduction there, my name is Scott. Uh, you may know me from some of my podcasts. If you do not listen to podcasts, I would encourage you to check out my show. It's called Hansel Minutes. It's quite short. It's only 30 minutes long, and the show is guaranteed not to waste your time. A lot of shows have a lot of chatter, a lot of chatter where they just talk about the weather. I get right into the technology. I also have another show that I do with Rob Connery. It's called This Developer's Life. You like that? We have a new episode coming soon. We're about 80% done with the episode. This is a show that is good for everybody, even uh, the non-technical people. It's also good for uh, spouses, so if you have a non-technical partner, uh, we talk about these kinds of things, uh, including I recently, my wife had cancer uh, recently. She's fine, though. Uh, and it turns out that when you're a programmer, you want to fix it. And you can't always fix stuff like that. So it's a more personal show. I would encourage you to check it out. I also did a couple of things recently in March. We had our annual March is for Makers, marchesformakers.com. So if you're thinking about Arduino, Raspberry Pi, you can learn about these things with us. We had a whole month where I partnered up with another group called Code Newbies, and we talked about it, uh, making things. I love to do all of these things. They make me very happy. I just can't stop. Now, as in the introduction, I do work at Microsoft. <laughs> but uh, I uh, work in Portland, Oregon, which is about four hours south of Seattle. So it's kind of like I'm on the forest moon of Endor, safely away from the Death Star. Plus, I work in open source, which makes the Death Star more open and more fun. Now, when I went to work at Microsoft originally, I came from the open source world, so many people were saying that I was a sellout. You know what that means, right, a sellout? I did it for the money, yeah? And they said, well, you did it for the money, we can't trust you anymore, uh, you're, you're a corporate shill. And it made me very sad, and I was crying a lot, and I didn't know <laughs> how uh, I would be... <laughs> Somehow, though, somehow I was able to comfort myself. Uh, this is a picture of me before Microsoft. You may have seen my show, The IT Crowd. Uh, and here's a picture of me after Microsoft. <laughs> so it, it worked out uh, OK in the end, yeah? Microsoft's got a really exciting org chart, if you've seen how our organizations work with each other. It's funny because it's true. So the talk that I want to share with you today is a talk about the cloud and the browser. And we're going to juxtapose, juxtapose those two ideas. This talk came from a discussion that I had after giving a talk at Intel. And I was speaking at Intel about the web and about virtual machines. And a gentleman came up to me afterwards, and he was quite old. Uh, I think he was probably in his 80s. Uh, uh, which in internet years is even older. And uh, this particular gentleman had been at Intel for like 40 years and was still one of the distinguished engineer types. And he wanted to be a web programmer. And this is very interesting. I mean, here is a, someone who could be, uh, you know, my father or my grandfather saying, I want to be a web developer. But I think to myself, well, you've been programming longer than I've been alive. What can I share with you that would be interesting? And he said, well, I've been in the, in the, the micro code. I've been in the assembler and in the, on the motherboard for 20 years. I don't know anything about the internet. I know about computer science, but I don't know about the internet. And it got me thinking 
how would we teach someone about today's internet if they understood computer science, but they skipped 20 years of the web, like all the yucky parts of the web, the bad stuff like tables and nested tables and one pixel GIFs, you know, and Netscape Navigator. <laughs> what if you just went to sleep and you woke up and the internet looked like it did today? Uh, how could you teach it to them? This is a picture of this man taking a selfie, just to give you an idea <laughs> of how old we're talking about. He's got a new phone there. We have to respect our elders, you know. We have to respect, you know, people who are doing the, the really difficult work. Uh, you know, you think that, oh yeah, this is my grandmother, maybe she doesn't know anything about computers, or maybe she invented the compiler. So we must respect our elders. So I said, well, let's talk first about the cloud, I said to this gentleman at Intel, and then we'll talk about the browser. There was a, a person at, at IBM in the 40s who said, I think there's a market for maybe five computers, right? Have you heard this quote? This is one of those famous quotes on the internet. You don't really know if it's a quote or not. Uh, I think it was Abraham Lincoln who said that you can't trust quotes on the internet. <laughs> so I don't know if this is a true quote or not. I couldn't find anything about Thomas J. Watson who ran IBM. Uh, but I did find this really old book. So I'm just gonna say that was the guy. <laughs> if, if I'm making up quotes, I'm just gonna put random pictures of uh, the guy. So we'll say that was him. So he said this, what did he mean though? What did he mean five computers? This was back when a computer filled a room. These are giant refrigerator computers. He honestly thought there would be one in Europe, the Europe computer. Right? And I'm sure the British would probably insist on their own computer, but, you know, uh, <laughs> there, would be, <laughs> there would be one computer, you know, for each continent. And then once you'd sold all the computers, that would be the end of it, and there would be that many computers, right? Um, here's a picture of the Azure uh, computer. <laughs> now, I, I realize that Azure is a little behind. Uh, we, we're getting color. Uh, it's coming soon, which is going to be nice. Uh, we're getting some really great upgrades. Here we're installing a new data center in, in Ireland. It's going to be really awesome. And, uh, and this guy is really, ex actually, that's the, there, there we go. This guy is really excited about that. So when we say the cloud, what do we mean? Well, what was interesting about the cloud isn't the cloud itself. It's the concepts about uh, virtual machines. So I said to the gentleman at Intel, what are the characteristics of an operating system? Let's just talk about those. It has to have memory management. It has often a graphics subsystem. It has APIs. It has storage and networking. If you have those things, you can say that's an operating system. And he says, I know. I invented that. So I said, OK, OK. Uh, but that sits on top of hardware, right? Uh, what's interesting is when you have a virtual machine and you can lie to the computer and it doesn't know that it's not real. It doesn't know it's talking to virtual hardware. And what that gives you is portability. And that's when the revolution began, when you could take a virtual machine and put it in your pocket and carry it around with you and then pick it up and take it from one provider to another provider. I remember the first time I saw VMware, the very first time I was running you know, like Windows in a window and I just like, that's amazing. If people who worked on um, early virtual machines and virtualization technology in mainframes remember this kind of stuff. Uh, it's not as revolutionary as we would think. It's always been with us. But the portability aspect was what is interesting. And also the ability to choose. That you can do something like run Linux in Azure. It freaks out a lot of customers. They're like, is, why, is that allowed? Are we, is it OK to do? Does Scott Guthrie know that you have Linux in Azure? And we'll say, well, what do you think it's running on? <laughs> it's running on Windows. So we win anyway, right? What, what's, the, what's Microsoft's dirty little secret, right? Does Microsoft care if you run Linux in Azure? No. They want your for loop. We're now in the for loop business. 
I don't care what language you write your for loop in or what operating system you do your for loop in. I just want one penny an hour every time your for loop runs and then Microsoft gets paid, right? That's the new business that we're in. You can go up to places like VM Depot, which is a whole place of thousands of open source virtual machines. And I can say, I want this uh, Jenkins virtual machine running on Ubuntu. And I can go and get the commands directly to go and create a virtual machine. And I can go out to the command line and just make one. I asked the gentleman at Intel, how do you make a virtual machine today? And he says, well, we have to fax this permission slip to IT and then they have to sign it and then we wait two weeks and then the virtual machine is provisioned. I was like, you fax it. And some of you are crying because you know that you've done this before. You've filled out a fax. Uh, actually, I have an uncle who's not very technical and sometimes he will uh, take a picture and then print it out on his inkjet printer and then take it directly into the scanner and then scan it back to me because it has an email button on the scanner. So he can take a picture, he uploads it to his computer, prints it out, scans it back, and then emails it to me. So then I get this inkjet pattern on all of the pictures that I get from him. I said, well, you don't want a fax to create a virtual machine. You want an API. I can type VM create, and I get this cool command line, and it's got ASCII art, which means Microsoft isn't evil anymore. And <laughs> that's, did you know that that's what ASCII art meant? It's true. Uh, and that makes a virtual machine, and that's great. Virtual machines let you do anything. They let you run anything. The problem, though, with virtual machines is that they're free like a puppy. Hey, free puppy, ah, that's great. But then what do you got to do with the puppy? You got to water it, and I don't know anything about animals, but you water the puppy and make it happy or whatever, you know? Uh, you have to keep it alive. You have to run Windows Update on the puppy. Uh, when you have a virtual machine, you have to maintain it, right? So sometimes people think that the cloud is just what hipsters call hosting. You ask an older person, hey, we have the cloud. They go, oh, I have the cloud. I got a cloud in my closet. I've been running Linux and on a laptop in my closet for years. That's the cloud. The cloud is more than just lift and shift, right? You can't just say, oh, I moved my virtual machine into the cloud. That's a very simplistic view. Additionally, I don't want to maintain a virtual machine. If, if I'm given an application to run like an expense reporting system, and I put it on a VM, I want it to run. But if then a new bug comes out, like remember Heartbleed, then I have to SSH in and update the VM because something unrelated broke. I always have to go and run apt-get update and apt-get upgrade, and I never know which order. So I just keep running them over and over until the VM shuts up and stops. And then on Windows, you've got Windows Update that reboots you randomly. Just whenever, like there's a Windows Update that's gonna come up in the middle of my talk probably in a minute here. And you know what's wrong with Windows Update? Have you ever been like typing on your machine and then time slows down and you're about to press enter and the Windows Update starts to come up? <laughs> and you, you can't stop it, right? Because it's, it's like transparent, but it's getting less transparent. And gravity is pulling your hand down to press enter. And there's two buttons. There's restart now and restart later. And restart now is default. <laughs> and then it's like, no. But your hand is so heavy and you can't stop it. There's only one thing in the world that can stop Windows Update. Do you know what that is? It's a dirty notepad. You get Notepad up, you go like that, and then Notepad says... <laughs> and then the power and the glory and the wonder of Windows says, oh, I can't restart Notepad. <laughs> I, gotta, I gotta save this file. So my tip to you is you have to log into all of your servers and get a dirty notepad ready just because you got to stop at some point a Windows update. 
So you don't want to do virtual machines. Virtual machines are no fun. You want to do something like a website. A website lets you run fewer things, but then the cloud will manage the operating system. I like to do it like this, right? A uh, virtual machine is like your first car, right? You have to learn to change the oil and maintain the machine. But once you've learned how to manage your car and change your oil and change your tires, then you pay somebody to do all of that. It's important to teach children to change the oil once. And then they suffer and you go, ah, ha, ha. And then you say, now you pay somebody, right? This is why we learn assembly language or C. You make them suffer, <laughs> right? You say, ah, maintain memory, malloc, delete, move AX, comma, zero. Ha, 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 garbage collection. That's okay. <laughs> you, don't, you don't need to do any of that. We just, we, we just wanted to see you suffer. All right, then you get a rental car, but then you become rich and famous, you want a limousine, right? Yeah, I love limousines. <laughs> but here's the thing, the layers of abstraction, right, get built on top of the virtual machine. Uh, I've been doing this now for 25 years, okay? So you know how they tell you that your, your resume, your CV should only be one page? That's crap. I have like a four page resume. The second page, is just how to load balance in a web farm. All this stuff I learned in the 90s, right? Hook up a Cisco local director and make it talk to a web farm and you know, do round robin load balance. He's nodding, he knows what's up. He's got two pages on that in his entire CV. Here's what happens though and why people like me don't like the cloud is that I used to be the cloud. My boss would say, uh, we need you to scale from one server to three servers. Get on that. And I would go and buy the computer and install the memory and install the hard drive and set up the load balancer and then he would come back on Monday and he'd go, ah, oh, the cloud is amazing. He just scaled it out. You can scale it out to five now instead of three. And that was an entire page of my CV. And now, it's a slider bar. I, I literally had to throw away all of page two. Effectively, the 90s are gone. It's a waste of time. And then the young person that I work with, the 22-year-old, is like, ugh, this web farm is taking like a minute to configure. This sucks. <laughs> and you wonder why I'm mad about being an old guy. I was like, I learned how to do a web farm in the 90s. It took me months. And now, this line here, updating a server farm. Every time I see that line, it's like the 90s didn't matter to you. They were a waste of time. It was 10 years wasted. And I'm upset about that. But that's exciting, though, because it's a solved problem. This is why I think it's so funny, and I think Germans will understand this, because everyone's afraid of the cloud. I don't know about privacy. I don't know about data management. You know, I think our, our people are better at managing the cloud. We'll, we'll let them manage it, right? We'll run our own server, right? Gustav has a server under his desk, and it's a really great server, and he manages it well. He knows more about managing that server than Amazon or Oracle or Sun or Microsoft. You know, the experts, he'll, he'll do that. It's better, right? Gustav then gets hit by a truck. We don't know the password to that machine, <laughs> but it's running under his desk, just don't turn it off. That's the cloud, don't turn it off the cloud. These are solved problems. Uh, data redundancy, raid, server farms, firewalls, all the stuff that we learned the hard way throughout the last 20 years are now checkboxes and slider bars. So this is what's so exciting for this person at Intel. He knows how a server farm works and how lo load balancing works, but he doesn't need to worry about it because it's a checkbox now, or it's a simple command in, uh, in a, a cloud system like Azure. I can go in there, I can do it programmatically, and for some people who don't understand how that works, they just go, what just happened? They don't know, it's magic. It's a layer of abstraction, it's completely hidden. The other thing that I told the gentleman at Intel was that even though I work for Microsoft and I like Azure, use whatever cloud makes you happy. Use the bookstore, 
I'm sure the bookstore is a great cloud. Use a cloud that doesn't care about language choice, though. He's like, well, what language should I pick? Whatever one makes you happy. That's the great thing. Don't let anyone tell you that you're not doing web development right because of your language choice. Right? Don't believe in religious zealots. Oh, Node ugh, sucks. Oh, C Sharp, you can't do real work in C Sharp. Oh, PHP, don't, well, don't do PHP, seriously. But <laughs> everything else is totally valid, right? Anything else you want to use. Use the language that makes you happy because a good cloud doesn't care. If you want to use Python or whatever, make Erlang. Do what you want to do. And he thought that was great. I said, you can run anything you want. And then he passed out. I said, you can do ASP.NET. It's all open source. And he's like, woo. And the SDKs for your cloud should be open source. He thought that was great because you want to see the code. All the Azure SDKs, totally open source, all the languages. Most Visual Studio, this is all actually a list of all the open source in Visual Studio, including a bunch of GPL code, all also open source. It's a higher level of abstraction. Speaking of higher levels of abstraction, I was at a conference, I want to say in Copenhagen, and there was a person there named Adrian Cockcroft. Have you ever seen him speak? He used to be the chief architect of Netflix. The guy's amazing, amazing. Looks kind of like John Malkovich. And uh, he was talking about how Netflix scaled out to Europe and then how they moved from uh, spinning rust, standard hard drives, spinning rust, to SSDs. Because I've always believed if I can hear your hard drive, I can't trust you. <laughs> it's time to get an SSD. Spend the money. Even if it was an expensive SSD and it only lasts for a year, that's a dollar a day for endless constant joy. I've even swapped out hard drives like on person on like work machines. Hey boss, can I have an SSD? No, we don't have the budget. I'll swap that shit out myself because it's a dollar a day. It's less than a coffee and I would just be like you wake up and you're like, I have an SSD. My laptop is fast. That's amazing. Get an SSD. So Adrian is a British, British guy, uh, which means when he gives a presentation, he gets plus two charisma just because he's British, right? I, you know, he comes out and he's like, hello, I'm going to talk about the cloud. Oh, my God. Right? But I come out and I'm like, America, cloud, and immediately negative two intelligence. It's a huge problem. <laughs> so he comes out and uh, he gives this presentation about how they're moving over to SSDs. And he talks about a thing called IOPS, right? You know, like input operations per second. It's a number that people use when they talk about the cloud to talk about throughput, like I.O. And he was paying, I think, like a dollar for 300 IOPS. And then he found out that Amazon would give him, I think it was like 2,000 IOPS or 3,000 IOPS for $3. And it was like, wait a second, six or seven times more performance, three times more money will we'll get SSDs. So he migrated all of their systems from spinning Rust to SSDs. Very simple decision. Three times more money, 10 times more perf, awesome. And he, thought, he talked about this, because he's the chief architect. That's the layer of abstraction that he's working at. And then afterwards, a young person, and I apologize if I'm picking on any young people, I think the person was like, I don't know, 12, uh, <laughs> comes up to ask a question, and I, I don't do a Norwegian accent, but I can do nerd. And he's like, well, actually, you know, uh, Mr. Cockcroft, the uh, SSDs are ex extremely unreliable and you should not be using them because they will be failing. And he starts going on, the guy's got a PhD in Netflix or something, I don't know. <laughs> and he's, he's British. Don't mess with a British person. And he's the chief architect of Netflix. And basically this kid says, I'm just paraphrasing, you're an idiot. <laughs> SSDs are not reliable. And now Netflix is built, built on a, a house of cards, no pun intended, <laughs> and it's all going to collapse, right? And he stands there and he says, well, what do you, what do you think about that? You know, isn't that a problem? And Cockcroft is like, that's not my problem. I'm renting them. Oh, oh, oh my God, he's renting them. It doesn't matter. 
What if they fail? What if the SSDs fail? Whose problem is that? Amazon's problem. Hey, my rental car has a flat tire. Hey, I totally trashed my hotel room, which I, I totally did. Um, <laughs> it's completely thrashed. But it's platform as a service. So when I get back, I expect it to have been completely rebooted. <laughs> Always thrash your hotel room just to make sure that the system is working. <laughs> so he says this, it's not my problem, I'm renting them. And the kid just stood there. He didn't even know what hit him. It was really sad. It was like in like a ninja movie when the ninja goes like, like this and cuts the guy's head like this and then the head slides off the body and falls and the brain is exposed and then the body just kind of sits there and someone needs to push the body over because it doesn't know that it's dead. Now, I don't have a picture of that. Uh, that's what happened though. But I do have this. This was basically what happened. <laughs> we'll do that again just to make sure you see the grenade and then the return and then it was, it was beautiful. It was amazing. You don't mess with someone like that. But the most important thing was that what level of abstraction is he working at? He's a chief architect of the cloud at Netflix, so he's thinking about things like maps with dots. He's not thinking about one computer on one spindle in one thing, and he doesn't care. Again, I'm upset about this because in the 90s, I care about that one hard drive, and I have to swap it out really quickly. With him, I figure that they just pushed a button that said Europe, and then they all went to lunch. And then the Netflix just went everywhere, and they just had a script. It's probably a bash script. So you want to have a dashboard that looks like this, right, that shows you all of the amazing high-level business things you need. But people then start building crazy dashboards, and it gets out of control. And then the old people will go and say, I have a dashboard. <laughs> I don't need no cloud dashboard. I got top. And then some of the younger people will be like, well, you know, there's a new H-top. So <laughs> it's, it's better. You know, it's, it's color. All right, fine. I'll upgrade to H-top. You don't get to say that that's better. You know what I'm saying? When someone says something like that, when they're so wrong that it's like they said, you know, sky is purple. You can say that all you want, right? Someone is wrong on the internet. You don't get to say that that's a dashboard. The, the, the cloud is coming. You don't get to say that, you're, that a dashboard is, 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 is not a good idea. You don't get to say that Mario is better than Luigi. Luigi is better. That's a fact, right? Water is wet. God is good. The sky is blue. Luigi is the superior Mario brother. It's always been Luigi. <laughs> I just wanted to get that out there about Luigi. So if we're talking about a higher level of abstraction, what other problems can we solve? There was a really interesting technical problem that some folks at the New York Times needed to do. They had 150 years of the New York Times, okay, and they had it in scanned TIFF files, terabytes and terabytes of this stuff. And someone said, probably a pointy-haired boss with a suit, said, can you uh, OCR these, right, recognize them, put them into PDFs, make them searchable with the text, so then we can put the New York Times online. So then you think about the, the, the problem there, the business problem for each episode, you know, issue of the New York Times, recognize it, make a PDF, for each. But there's 150 years of daily New York Times thing. It's going to take until the sun death of the universe to write this for loop. You know, even though the for loop is easy to write, the running is the, the tricky part. Uh, so what they did is they started to think about how to do that. And they said, well, we, we did it once. We'll make a for loop. It's going to take a lot of time. Uh, we should probably use multiple computers, so then suddenly it's a parallelism problem. Well, then those multiple computers have multiple processors. We should probably go across multiple processors, and they have multiple threads. And the boss comes back and says, aren't you done yet? And they say, well, yeah, I'll be done in a second. I'm solving the problem of parallelism in the cloud. 
right? This is called yak shaving. Are you familiar with the idea of yak shaving? Yak, Y-A-K. A yak, the yak shaving is like, well, they gave you a problem, and I'll get to that problem as soon as I'm done shaving this yak. It's the problem that you have to solve before the problem that you've been asked to solve. Go ahead and uh, make a for loop for me that scales, and I need it done for the weekend. All right, well, parallelism, what language should I pick? Do I have enough disk space? How much disk space am I going to need? Do I need a queue? How many machines? How much money? Are you done yet? Well, hang on. And it becomes uh, a problem. Actually, I'm going to go and Google for something, or I'll, maybe I'll Google with Bing for something. Um, uh, Brian Cranston, yak shaving gif. This could go bad, so if it does, we'll just shut off the camera. Here it is. This is, this, is, this is yak shaving as a GIF. He wants to fix this light bulb, okay? He comes home, and the light bulb is off. So he's like, oh, oh crap, I'm going to fix this light bulb. So he goes, he finds a light bulb. Oh, well, the shelf is kind of broken. I'm going to fix the shelf before I get, the, oh, well, this drawer is kind of messed up. I've got to fix the drawer. It's a little squeaky. Oh, well, I don't have enough of that. I'm going to go to drive to the car and get some oil. Oh, the car won't start. Oh, crap. Have you fixed the light bulb yet? What do you think I'm doing? <laughs> you get it? That's yak shaving. It's totally true because you're like, oh my god, I do that. That's my whole job. <laughs> so what if you could raise the layer of abstraction? Here's an example of a, of a function, do it, uh, that takes some text and you know, says I ran in the cloud and then writes, you know, takes some input and does some output. This could be the same function that they're going to do. Do it. But I want you to do it a million times. Now we are in a parallelism problem. But what if I could go and put some attributes on that function and then run that function in the cloud and the problem of parallelism turned into a slider bar? Just like the problem of scaling a web app became a slider bar. What if this was what we call naively parallel? also called delightfully parallel. That means parallel where there aren't any dependencies. I got a million of something. I got 10 computers, split it up, 100,000 per. Well, how many processors? Use all the computers and all the processor space as much as you can. What about the disks? Shard the disks, figure out the right, do the right thing. Parallelism, naive parallelism, is a solved problem. That's where you get things like Amazon Lambda and Azure functions. We're talking about a layer of abstraction that's above virtual machines, above web apps. Now we're talking about a function that we want simply to scale out. This is what the folks at the New York Times did, and it actually cost about $300. They got a credit card, they did it for $300. Turns out, it actually only cost $150, but the first time they had an error and they had to run it twice. <laughs> that's the cloud. That's why things are interesting. But still, we insist on maintaining virtual machines. So he thought this was all great stuff, the gentleman from Intel. And I said, all right, that's the server side. Let's talk about the browser. Remember this, this diagram, the characteristics of an operating system. There was a time when you would sit down at a machine that looked like this and talk to a machine that looked like this. And you would go and you would visit a, you would visit a, 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 an application, and, and then that would, show, that would sit here. The UI would be over there. But where is the work happening? The work's happening in the giant refrigerator. This was, when I, when I tell this to young people, I say, this is how we browse the web, right? The text appears over here, and it comes from there. And we like have BBSs and things like that, right? The user interface was sent across the wire and then rendered over here. The, you know, old is new. Well, this happened then, right? This is the first web page. That's the original. And it's actually still at the same location. The URL for the beginning of the internet hasn't changed. But somehow the URL for your website has changed like 50 different times, right? You know, every time you come up with a new product catalog, it's a 404. No one seems to want to redirect. But Tim Berners-Lee, he kept the same URL. So you should think about that the next time you break a URL at your work. Another great thing about Tim Berners-Lee, 
is I want you to note his uh, job title. He could have said the, <laughs> but he didn't. And I think that shows a great deal of restraint. And it also indicates that he's a very modest person. And as I see, some of you all have very, very complicated and very long business cards with commas at the end and stuff. And the person that invented the internet just put web developer. I really think that's classy. <laughs> I've been doing this for 25 years. So my re my inter mine says junior uh, web developer now. <laughs> you know, until he's dead, I can't get promoted. So the, he starts the internet, and the internet is just a series of pages, right, as we move from place to place. It's just an infinite book. He didn't think about it as an application platform. He thought about it as a bunch of pages. And then this happens, right? And how did we know that this happened? Because we were browsing the internet, we're clicking from page to page, and, that, and then Java loads. <laughs> That's how we knew it happened. And then these guys are like, we can do it too, whee! And then these guys are like, we've got YouTube. We matter, right? But what were we doing? Why were we doing this? We were doing it because we wanted an application platform. And the only way we knew how to do it was with a plug-in to the web where we brought an entire virtual machine into a box on a web page, which then gave you things like this. True story. Uh, I'm an engineer, you're all engineers. You're probably the kind of engineer that when you go to like check in at the airline, uh, the person's behind their system and you want to know what that system is. So you're like, yeah. Yeah. Which, what are you guys, uh, what are you running? And then the next thing you know, you're actually sitting behind the counter going, yeah, so that's just a via, an, you know, AS400. How do you talk to the back end? That's how I work. Uh, I, I have a, a, a Toyota Prius because I'm from Portland and they give them to them give it to them when we're born. They give us a Prius because we are green. Um, so I was taking the car into the Toyota dealership to have the oil changed, right? Platform as a service. And uh, usually they had an AS400 and a VT100 terminal and they would talk to this back end system. And then one day I showed up and they had all new Dells. And I was like, oh, what's going on? What'd you build? And the guy knows I'm a programmer. And he says, oh, let me tell you about the new system. It's amazing. He says, check it out. And he fires up Windows XP. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> you know, I didn't even know what, I didn't want to tell him. You know, it's too late. And then he loads Firefox. And then he visits a web page and then loads a jar file. And then Java is like, are you sure you want to run Java? And he's like, yes, I'm sure I want to run Java. And then it says, are you really sure you want to run Java? Because really, no one is doing that anymore. Uh, you know, please type. No one's running Java anymore in the, in the browser here to indicate, you know, sign the document and fax it in to say it's OK to run Java. And then he loads a terminal emulator and terminals back to the AS400 and then looks me in the eye and says, this is way better than before. <laughs> We've taught our users that that's OK. It's a little box of virtualness, virtualness, virtualness. It's a little VM in a box. Berners-Lee's web is around that. You know, right, we, Microsoft didn't kill Silverlight, right? The internet killed Silverlight. It happened automatically. The internet needed a way to run applications. We, we needed to stop this madness, the physics demos and the teapot. It's ridiculous. So JavaScript happens. And don't ever do this. Java people hate that. They hate that. <laughs> I don't even know why they called it JavaScript, right? Just because it's fun to say Java. Feels nice in your mouth. Java. JavaScript. Uh, this is a flow chart of what it's like to work in JavaScript. So JavaScript came out, and you know, do you remember the first time that you realized JavaScript wasn't a toy? We all had this moment. I'm being totally serious here. You, were, you know, you were filling out a form, you typed in your phone number, and you hit tab, and then the form turned red, and you went, and you went back, and you typed it again, and you hit tab, and the 
said invalid phone number. And you said, I don't think it posted back to the server. You tested it a couple times. You're like, holy crap, it's validating the whole form on the client. I don't know about you, but then I ripped my laptop up and I was running with the laptop. Because that's how really unfit programmers run with their laptops. And I ran to my wife and I was like, it's validating on the client side. And she's like, I don't care. And I was running and I was like, look at that, it's amazing. And I still don't care. And I was like, this means that JavaScript is not a toy. And I went into the first name field and I was like, my first name is Alert pwned, and uh, it was like, yeah, pwned. I was like, JavaScript is not a toy. And all the while, there's like, you know, some 12-year-old Danish kid that goes and makes a Commodore 64 emulator entirely in JavaScript just because, like, he wanted to see if it was real. Like, can we do this? What crazy stuff can we do with JavaScript? So then people started doing totally insane stuff, like this. Black square. It's amazing. I'm going to hit refresh in a second if you don't start up black square. What's happening? Has the black square let him down? This is a complete implementation of Linux and a complete Pentium processor implemented entirely in JavaScript. And you say, no, it's not. You're lying, Hanselman. How do you know? Well, what you do when you find something awesome on the internet that you think might be written in JavaScript but you're not sure is you select it. And you say, wait a second, that feels like HTML. And then you right click on it. And what are you looking for when you right click? You're looking for it to say, about Flash. <laughs> and you go, liar! You were trying to fool me. That's real. That is JavaScript in Linux. How real is it, though? It's this real. Let's go down here, and I'm going to go, and I'm going to say, TCC, hello, hello.c. So now I'm compiling a C application in a JavaScript virtual machine running in a browser, running on Windows. And I did this once at uh, a conversation at the Linux Foundation in, uh, in Portland, Oregon, and a guy yelled at me and said, how come you're not using GCC? <laughs> and I was like, I don't think you understand that I'm compiling a C application in a JavaScript virtual machine, and you're complaining about my choice of compiler. <laughs> so I opened up an iPhone emulator on a Windows machine, and then ran Linux in it. <laughs> so now I'm compiling a C application in a JavaScript virtual machine inside of mobile Safari on an iPhone emulator on a Windows machine. <laughs> so I think it's OK. <laughs> GCC. Freaking FOSS people. Seriously, like appreciate the awesomeness of that. But no, he did not appreciate that. You know the people that run with JavaScript disabled? You might have this problem in Germany. We have this problem in the US when you meet a new person for the first time and you go, hey, I'm Scott. And they say, I'm vegan. <laughs> and I do CrossFit. And I run with JavaScript disabled. And I go, I just asked your name. <laughs> you can't disable JavaScript, you'll die. The great JavaScript scare, does this work with, my boss, does this work with JavaScript disabled? No, it doesn't work with JavaScript disabled, you idiot. Well, what about no cookies? Well, you have to say, we're using cookies, is that okay? Every single time you visit the site, but yeah, it totally works with cookies. It's obnoxious. By the way, I got to Europe and suddenly my computer is telling me there's cookies, watch out on every page. What are you guys doing? When Britain leaves, do they have to push the OK button on the cookie too, or do they? 
Or it's a biscuit, I think, at that point, right? <laughs> People are creating amazing applications written entirely in JavaScript. This is one that was the iPad game of the year in 2011, and they did it entirely in JavaScript again. People are using the, the Unity and the Unreal engines in JavaScript. Now, at this point, most people who have seen JavaScript-related talks will say, oh, I know, yeah, you, you take C++ code and you run it through Clang and then through Mscripten, and that turns into asm.js, which then uses Open G, OpenGL. So you're basically compiling C code into JavaScript. Now you're probably going to show me a demo of Quake running in the browser. Mm. No. No, I'm not going to do that. It's too easy. But what I am going to do is I'm going to take the characteristics of JavaScript and then overlay them with the characteristics of a virtual machine. And it looks like we have garbage collection, we have WebGL, we've got a little database, we've got security, we've got web workers. JavaScript has all the characteristics of an operating system, a complete operating system, and even more so a virtual machine with an abstraction layer. Now, Atwood's law says that any application that can be written in JavaScript will eventually be written in JavaScript. <laughs> that indicates that JavaScript is, I think, Turing complete. Uh, the problem with that theory is that you can also say that any application that can be written in Microsoft Excel will eventually be written in Microsoft Excel, in including a pixel-perfect implementation of Pac-Man, where each individual cell is one pixel. Yeah, like, it's, it really happened. And this is so amazing and so incredibly perfect, to be clear, that's one cell, that it can't be stopped. may actually bring the entire operating system down. <laughs> Do, uh, did any of you hear about my Halloween costume last year? I went as uh, Microsoft Outlook. <laughs> I got a, uh, uh, like a, a shower curtain that was kind of see-through, and I wrote not responding at the top. <laughs> and I just walked around the party just refusing to speak to anyone. <laughs> what is he? Outlook. So you have another operating system then available to you that is the browser on your mobile phone. That means that there's two operating systems on your phone, the one it came with and the one inside the browser. So that means we should start writing everything in JavaScript and HTML5, but this guy says that that's a bad idea. He says that that was a mistake and we should have been a bet on HTML5. We should have done everything in native. But that's not really true because there's a number of different implementations and reimaginings of JavaScript that were done uh, and are just as fast as the native stuff. Now, there's another quote from a very famous philosopher that says, the avalanche has already begun. That's my boss. Why are you bothering me, man? He's chatting me. Um, the avalanche has already begun. It's too late for the pebbles to vote. Think about that. What is the avalanche? It's HTML, HTML5, JavaScript. It's coming down the mountain. The entire mountain is coming down on top of us. And the pebbles are having a vote about whether that's a good idea. The pebbles, in this case, are your bosses. Do you think HTML5 is really ready? I don't, it's probably not baked. You know, JavaScript, is, it's probably a little early to bet on JavaScript. Should we bet on the web? You think the internet's going to be a thing? <laughs> Who said that? Which of our famous philosophers said that? Anyone remember? Is it Kierkegaard, maybe? No? It was uh, Kosh from Babylon 5. <laughs> I'm very disappointed that no one knew that. No Babylon 5 people here. Maybe it didn't make it over here yet. <laughs> I don't know. But when we say HTML5, how much of it's really HTML, and how much of it is just a blanket term for HTML and JavaScript and CSS, right? It's, when you say HTML5 applications, you mean all of that stuff. And that means all of it, like all the parts and pieces that come with web development today. It's really difficult to be a web designer. 
But there, there was a, yeah, this guy has no butt. Just goes just right into his legs. His back goes right into his legs. There was a time when I was starting out when the most difficult problem in computer science was HTML tables. This is true. My old people will remember. Remember when you could go up and get a job because you knew how to do tables. Do you know how to uh, do tables? I do. <laughs> Boom, junior engineer, right off the street. Couple of years later, hey, do you know how to do a uh, row span? I do know how to do row span. <laughs> Boom, senior engineer, I'm running the whole team. Because I can tell you that the maximum number of nested tables that you can use in Netscape Navigator is 33. Yeah, and the only way that you know that is when you've written that 33 or 33rd <laughs> nested table and you've stared Satan himself in the face. See, I don't think so, Satan. Yeah, it's true. HTML these days is just this. It's just a div. HTML is just the structure, right? CSS provides all the style and the color, and CSS is this amazing and powerful and expressive language that allows you to get exactly what you want on the first try. You just think it, and it happens. And the box model, it's, just, it's amazing and powerful. Everyone loves working in CSS. And then you use JavaScript as the glue for everything else. And, and of course, JavaScript, you know, you, you pick it up, it's extremely easy to get started. <laughs> and you don't even need to learn uh, the bad parts. <laughs> Stepping through a function in JavaScript. Uh, John, John Resig, who wrote jQuery, uh, wrote this amazing book. It's called Secrets of a JavaScript Ninja. That is a samurai. <laughs> and I said, so I said, I said, I said, John Resig, why is there a picture of a samurai on your book, Secrets of a JavaScript Ninja? And he said, JavaScript is loosely typed. <laughs> That's the best answer that anyone could ever give. There's a ninja, samurai, duck typing. Fantastic. <gasps> I apologize for that joke. There was a time when I wrote a blog post called JavaScript is the assembly language of the web. That became a quote, became a thing. I'm going to make that a quote. It's an amazing quote. Uh, but everyone else said it too, right? When you say a quote, a declarative statement on the internet, people will argue, argue with you about it, right? It became a whole thing, and all these people on Reddit were telling me that I was full of crap. It's not really the assembly language of the web. Maybe it's the machine language, blah, 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 blah. semantics, semantics. So I went and I asked the people who designed JavaScript if they thought JavaScript had become the assembly language of the web. So I went to Brendan Eich, who invented JavaScript. And I said, hey, Brendan Eich, is Java that is actually uh, the actor Brendan Fraser uh, <laughs> from The Mummy. Uh, but th that is uh, Brendan Eich. But, uh, but Brendan Fraser is a beautiful man, so we'll keep him up there. Uh, I said, <laughs> JavaScript, he says, I said JavaScript is the x86 of the web a couple of years ago, but I can't really claim it's original. This happened for a number of years, and then a couple of months ago, the web is getting WebAssembly. It's happening. Google, Microsoft, and Mozilla are getting together and making an assembly language for the internet where you can compile C, C++, into a subset of assembly language that, that's going to run at full speed inside of what? The JavaScript virtual machine. That's amazing. That is exciting because I was right. You can compile things like CoffeeScript into idiomatic JavaScript. CoffeeScript is what Ruby people wish JavaScript was. That's not a joke, that's a fact. Uh, TypeScript is what C Sharp people wish JavaScript was. Both of those languages compile to the exact same idiomatic JavaScript. 
So you can compile to an assembly language on readable, obfuscated JavaScript, or you could actually use the style of the language that you want, and you can transpile, transform into idiomatic JavaScript. That's why TypeScript is such a great language. You have to be careful, though, that you don't want to have layers add too much complexity. We talk about how uh, layers in the cloud can be really powerful, but then you get someone with jQuery, they start doing fancy stuff, and they think, hey, I can do anything. I'm amazing. I'm powerful. Hey, jQuery. Because they don't really understand like, what's happening underneath. They don't understand the system like, underneath. I'm going to do that one again. So remember this here, right? Know the underlying stuff. Don't use a library that you don't understand. The problem is no one writes JavaScript anymore, right? They write, they write jQuery. You can actually interview someone and say, can you select a DOM element? And then they'll open the dollar sign. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's, that's jQuery. I want you to write JavaScript. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how to do that. And you know whose fault it is? It's jQuery's fault. <laughs> you know about jQuery? So if you go to Wikipedia and you look for jQuery, you're going to find jQuery. And jQuery uh, has a thing. This article is about the actor. Uh, you've got to go here to learn about jQuery. <laughs> uh, so I needed to find out all I know about jQuery. Uh, that's jQuery. Uh, he said that. This is his IMDB page about some of the work that jQuery has done. Uh, he was in Fred the Show, uh, and then Fred 2, Night of the Living Fred, apparently a <laughs> TV movie. And the great thing is that once you've learned that jQuery is, is a thing, you've ruined jQuery for you as a company, right? Because you're going to go back to work, and your boss is going to be like, hey, so we should probably use jQuery for this... Uh, this project, and then you can be like, I don't know, I'll call his agent uh, and see if, he's, uh, see if he's available. I don't know, jQuery is a pretty busy, uh, busy person. I've ruined jQuery for you. Nobody uses that, they use jQuery. Because you get an idea in your mind about what you're going to build, and you know, like the vision of this application, it's going to be amazing, and then you build it, and it doesn't turn out kind of exactly right, and you don't, you don't know who to blame anymore. Um, no, I'm just kidding, I love SharePoint. Uh, and then you're sad. <laughs> People need to use vanilla JS, right? Use the real down-to-earth pieces of JavaScript. Uh, it's amazing to me how people are going to go and create an amazing new startup. There's all this JavaScript frameworks we can use, but before we do our startup, we'll write our own JavaScript framework because we, we know best. You've got to find the right balance. No JavaScript, but use a framework, but don't forget what's underneath. But we are in an amazing time right now where you get to expect more from your web tools because the pieces fit together correctly now. Once we got rid of IE6 and, and 7 and 8 and, and 9 and 10, uh, <laughs> things got OK, right? We've got Firefox, we've got Edge, we've got Chrome. And you can build systems that really work right now. You can build systems on the cloud that have massive scale and elasticity, and you can use any language that makes you happen, happy. But on the browser, we need to remember that these machines are really powerful. Even a crappy computer now is a multiprocessor computer. Every computer has an accelerated 3D graphics system. So why aren't we using that additional virtual machine? We have people say, well, I have 10 virtual machines in my cloud, and my system can't scale. Well, how many virtual machines are hitting your virtual machine, right? I mean, I've got a quad processor supercomputer in my pocket. I'm pretty sure that it can sort a list of 100 items. But we insist on writing software when you click on a table to sort. Well, everyone knows that Intel Pentium processor can't sort lists of you know, 10 items. So we post it back to the server and let the server do the sorting, and then we send the rendered stuff back as if we were talking to a mainframe and a dumb terminal. Why don't we send the data across and do visualizations? We generate graphics on the server and send PNGs across when we could be using things like D3.js to do these powerful and accelerated graphics things on the client. Uh, we forget that we have unlimited virtual machines, but the user has a powerful virtual machine. 
So if a thousand people hit your 10 virtual machines, you have a thousand and ten VMs that can be used. Rarely do you see anything taking up any CPU on a machine except for ads. Because they're using your browser's virtual machine to do interesting and useful work, unlike our web pages. So my call to action here is that the user's virtual machine is also part of the cloud, so we should put that to work. We should understand that the cloud doesn't need to work so hard, and we should remember that we should learn JavaScript and some systems language to put those virtual machines to work. And uh, I want you all to know that you are powerful, and this is what I told the gentleman at Intel. I said, you already know the cloud. You can go and program the browser. So get to work. Thank you all very much.